afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. Uh, just um, one quick announcement before we begin. Uh, next week's seminar by Dr. Ferenc Pitler will take place uh, with physical presence. Um, so whoever wishes to attend, please feel free to do so. Uh, as usual, the seminar will begin at 4 p.m. Uh, and will take place in the NTL event room at the Cyprus Institute. Um, and it will be followed with some tea and coffee uh, to follow. Uh, for those of you who are unable to join physically, uh, you can follow the seminar as usual via the Zoom link. Uh, and then on to today's presentation, uh, we are delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Faydon Brotsagis, uh, who is currently an FEBS Individual Postdoctoral Fellow at the Centre of Misfolding Diseases uh, of the University of Cambridge. In his work, he develops enhanced sampling molecular dynamics and integrative structural biology methods that combine experimental data with atomistic simulations for determining structural ensembles and force field optimization. Such integrative methods unveil, uh, methods, um, unveil control and uh, diagnose a variety of diseases. He mastered enhanced sampling molecular dynamics as a postdoc in the Paranello group at ETH Zurich and USI, and during his PhD uh, in the group of, sorry, in, uh, sorry, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Dr. Bratsagis, thank you for your time today, and we look forward to your presentation. So hi everyone, and uh, really thank you for, for, for the invitation, actually, for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to, to present some recent work um, but hopefully I will provide also some a general scope of what I've been doing. So I think so far this title pretty much, I think, summarizes well um, how, how I see this problem of basically using uh, molecular simulations along with experimental data, for instance, cryo-electron microscopy or, you know, kinetics uh, experimental data will show at the very end in order to basically interpret uh, molecular so uh, interpret experiments give a better accuracy to molecular dynamic simulation and then it uh, ultimately be able to have this microscopic understanding and to study to, to, to identify structures understand the interplay between the, the interconversion of these structures and namely their, their dynamics and how all of this uh, microscopic understanding leads to to function understanding. So this is how I see at least uh, biomolecular simulation. So truly as a, as a quantitative uh, computational microscope. Um, and yeah, I suppose this is basically a bit of indeed <laughs> well, my, my traveling. So it all started in Athens in the Technical University of Athens. Uh, University of Athens made it, went a bit to Amsterdam for my uh, PhD and to Zurich. And for a small uh, placement um, in, in Athens again for, for three months, like a short uh, visiting uh, postdoc and then back to Cambridge. So now trying to indeed to find uh, uh, my reversible way to go back to, to, to Athens. And this is probably a bit of a friendly side, but I suppose this is a good analogy uh, of these pathways. I mean, this is my favorite sport, which is uh, sailing. So indeed, starting in the Technical University of Athens with the Doris Theodorou, chemical engineering school, carried on with, uh, with my PhD in uh, the University of Amsterdam with Peter Bolhaus. As Cathy already mentioned there, I, I, was, uh, I was introduced to enhanced sampling simulations, made mostly path-based simulations with Peter Bolhaus. And I went to the ETH uh, Zurich where I continued with my uh, well, sampling uh, sort of career pathway with Michele Parinello. And I did a visiting postdoc in IVA. Um, and, and now I'm currently at the Department of Chemistry in Cambridge. So, well, basically, uh, indeed, the, uh, well, biology is, is really a molecular uh, and dynamic microverse. So the, I mean, there are biological matter, it's a very dynamic, um, it's, it's very dynamic, and this very dynamics is, is related to function. For instance, here we see um, that some cytokines here that bind in the microscopic level. Um, here we see another process which is called the microtubule self-assembly. Here you have proteins that basically walk. These are dynamic polymers. They assemble, they assemble, and basically they facilitate, they provide the means for proteins, transporter proteins to walk on it, carrying, for instance, these big vesicles uh, or this, um, well, um, phases that carry in it proteins. Um, and, and 
well, this is just a cartoon representation, but what I just want to highlight is, is that, uh, yeah, indeed, if we want to talk about and address biological um, questions, then we really have to stru st structure these very dynamics on the macroscopic um, level. Um, indeed, it, it has to do with the crosstalk of, of these agents, namely, for instance, proteins or other biomacromolecules like DNA or RNA, uh, in order to understand function, like, for instance, the inter and intracellular um, communication. Another example might be, for instance, in the case of the coronavirus and the pandemic, for instance, that you have this viral virions, in fact, um, in, inside, for instance, your saliva. Um, and then when you, when you sneeze, for instance, and you can transmit this uh, my, my particles, viral particles, which carry these receptors on its surface that bind here to uh, receptors of the cell, then uh, this facilitates the fusion of the virion into the interior of the cell, and then um, you have an exposure of the uh, genetic material, namely the RNA of, of, the, vi of the virus that hijacks the, the cell's machinery, for instance, here, like the ribosomes, um, and in order to produce new proteins that will be assembled into the new, um, basically, viral capsid and, and new membrane um, lipids that will do that. So, uh, yeah. Right. So, indeed, if you want to put this a bit more uh, formally into context, uh, you have these microscopic structures, and here this is just uh, one type, one, one protein um, that basically f f or exists or lives uh, in, in multiple type of structures. Each, each of these uh, microscopic now structure, which is, as I said, very related to the function, uh, exists in a particular population. This is a thermodynamic population. And then you have, of course, time scales, interconversion time, time scales from one state to the other. Now, so all these three, uh, well, features, if you wish, they, it, it, it is what I will be calling a structural ensemble. And, and, and this structural ensemble, there is another way to look at it, uh, that for instance, this is in the so-called free energy landscape approach. Uh, and this is, say, for a particular reaction coordinates uh, that can highlight, for instance, here, your folding pathways. You have uh, different structures with uh, that exist in different uh, free energy levels, or if you wish, um, yeah, basically, yeah, free energy levels. And then uh, these, these unfolded structures will interconvert to intermediate states on pathway towards the uh, folded state structure. So indeed, these structural ensembles can also be seen as, as, an, as a dynamic mechanism of converting or interconverting matter from one structure to another. And of course, for a given then protein sequence or well polymer sequence or whatever, a macromolecular sequence and given conditions, uh, matter forms this, uh, well, exists in these structural ensembles. Now, these structural ensembles, uh, if you, if you well, if you basically do any experiment, actually, um, for instance, here I highlight uh, NMRs like, so, so experiments like NMR here, or this is, for instance, uh, the uh, SACS experiments, then uh, basically the, the observable, if you wish, is reports on the structural dynamics. Um, for instance, here, these chemical shifts or HSQC chemical shifts, they, they report on which residues are close to which residues. So this, this report on the structure. And, uh, but you don't really get to have a very good way to go from these features here or these type of observables towards a microscopic uh, understanding. Uh, so you don't really get to have the XYZ coordinates. You don't really get to have the populations um, of these structures. And of course, you don't get to have easily the kinetics. So there is basically a problem of going from a macroscopic, macroscopic observables to microscopic uh, observables. So on the other hand, molecular simulations do provide you a microscopic understanding of your structural ensemble. Um, and, and this and, and these sort of structural ensembles or thermodynamic ensembles, they, they of course have well-defined often uh, ensemble average observable properties. Some of them can be, for instance, the fold, you can find the folding rate from molecular simulations. You can find drug and binding rates. 
binding constants, solubilities, and so on. So, um, so basically, you can have this two-way approach to get access to macroscopic uh, properties. Eh? One is coming from uh, a from above, say a top-down approach, and the other one is more of a bottom-up approach. And all of these properties, macroscopic properties, they do relate to a function. Uh, and this is some uh, type of well, function where proteins are very important. For instance, here you have antibodies. I will show later how the uh, dynamics of antibodies is, is quite important for the binding affinity to, to uh, antigens, for instance, like the spike protein. Uh, or cellular pumps, where this very dynamic uh, helices uh, at, at, a, at a basically membrane protein like ion transporters. So this very motion is important for that controls basically the, the electrostat so the electrostatic uh, potential and the flux, in fact, uh, from the out, out, outside to the interior of the of the cell. Um, Actually, this is a very, these are very important systems, by the way. Um, so it, it was, I participated in this, uh, in this conference where, where they were saying that this, this potential here, that the potential drop here is, is actually some orders of magnitude larger than, than the one of the lightning. So this is quite interesting. But anyway, going forward. So, but often when you ask, for instance, an experimentalist, uh, you know, uh, what, is, what is protein structure prediction? So usually uh, what they do is they determine a single structure uh, on a microscopic level and then they deposit in the PDB data bank, for instance. They usually, so this structure usually uh, reflects or, or, or accounts to a low, um, Oh, sorry, to, to, a, to a ground state. So it, it is very rare that you will see structures of low populated states that can be very functionally important. For instance, I mean, there is an example later on where you have a ground state of a protein, but only in this excited state or low populated state, um, you, you, I mean, it is, this protein is functional. So it's very rare that people deposit interconversion timescales between structures. This can happen, for instance, if you're doing an MR, and usually people build models of, uh, of, of several structures, and they can give you interconversion time scales. But this is a, a rare uh, type of experiment, and this the, the, the current actually uh, under well, view uh, it 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 really fails really to characterize uh, this structural heterogeneity. So how different what is the population of this structure? So they're really the problem is that they're the so the current way of looking at things is that you're really determining a single structure. And this is problematic. But I mean, the real world, uh, we know that for given constraints, like for instance, the temperature, pressure, or pH, and this was formulated by Gibbs or in fact, by thermodynamics, that you can have actually an ensemble of configurations or microstates, uh, which all together, for instance, um, given the particular constraints here, um, well, you can have an ensemble of structures that basically um, abides, in fact, to these constraints. So, um, so that's the problem, in fact, that if you if you determine a single structure, so the ground state, meaning that the high populated uh, state structure, you really fail to characterize the thermodynamic ensemble of protein configurations. So actually, this is a problem, eh? and in fact, if you if you also uh, come from from physics world then um for instance this is if you if you if you ask these three gentlemen here uh, that formulated the transition state theory basically a theory that that describes rigorously what is the time scale of a transition from a state a to a to b so they here formulated that this time scale or the rate constant in fact from leaving state a entering to state b is reversely proportional to this barrier height where transient configurations um, exist. So, um, yeah, so in, in fact, these very rare conformations that are in the transition state region are, are extremely rarely, if at all, reported in the cur current structure determination problem uh, as posed by experimentalists. So, exactly. So, in fact, this single uh, structure determination realm uh, fails to characterize, uh, you know, rare configurations that are very important for the kinetics. Um, so the way that 
I see at least, um, or we see this in, in, in our group, uh, this problem now is that we can, in fact, um, really combine the two worlds. So really combine uh, structural biology experiments with molecular simulations in order to tackle challenges that both have and then uh, get more accurate molecular, mod molecular dynamic structural ensembles that basically maximally fit uh, experimental data. Here I'm posing a few uh, well, basically challenges. For instance, if you focus here on the, on the experimental side, you can have different uh, experiments here, for instance, FRET or CryoEM or NMR, but these actually are uh, prone to errors. For instance, you can have systematic errors, uh, random errors, or forward model errors. Now the forward model is basically uh, a function that gets you from uh, your coordinate X to your observable F. So that's why I call a forward model, we call a forward model. And usually, you know, when, for instance, somebody measures a chemical shift, um, so the, the forward model is basically also able to get you from the chemical shift to the XYZ structure. But this reverse problem, uh, due to the inconsistency of the forward model, is, is, is not a well-posed uh, problem. So errors in the forward model actually um, can get you errors in your structure determination. And systematic errors, for instance, here, they, they have to do with uh, you know, the calibration of the experiment or beam radiation, if you're talking about cryoEM, how you position your FRET um, labels, for instance, if they report well on, on the two states, and random errors have to do with, with yeah, of course, uh, every so of on the experimentalist himself, and then how he he, you know, what's his I mean, if, uh, what's was his uh, daily, um, well, um, so, so 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 well, I mean, random errors. So his mood in 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 a sense. I mean, maybe he doesn't see a decimal, for instance, uh, if if the light is not very um, clear and so on. On the other hand, molecular dynamic simulations, they first, they, they, they have, I mean, they face challenges, in fact, because usually the molecular force field is inaccurate. Now, or if you have insufficiently sampled your configurational space or path space. And uh, yeah, I mean, molecular force fields, I, I assume most of you are aware of this, but basically they are um, potential energy surface um, functions uh, that are um, depicting the, for instance, strength of uh, bonded interactions or like, like torsions or, or bond uh, stretches or electrostatic interactions. And they are usually obtained by quantum mechanical parameterization or by, uh, you know, experimental heat capacities and I mean, they're erroneous and they're not universal. So a protein force field, for instance, that is good for folded proteins is not very good for uh, misfolded proteins or uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. So the question is, I mean, these are the challenges and, and how can we actually go about them? And uh, recently, about uh, six years ago, uh, well, uh, uh, so in my group of Michele van Ruskolo with along with Max, they developed this meta inference approach, which um, for but which is basically a, a Bayesian inference framework that um, inputs uh, so the basically inputs in an energy function uh, uh, the experimental data um, and the molecular uh, dynamics energy function, then builds a joint energy function that depends on your coordinates uh, given the data and then it samples from this energy function and this was a, basically they applied it um, in uh, well cryolectron microscopy data this is also applicable for NMR data and we implemented this approach and also now we're further developing it actually we're just about to uh, publish uh, submit actually a paper where we also do the enhanced sampling part so for instance if you're starting from an experiment and this is a single particle micrograph or of uh, of a cryo em experiment so this is basically ice on top of this uh, well in this ice you have particles in particular case this is for the spike protein uh, then what you do is that you are getting this, uh, well, this is, of course, a 2D 
map, and then you are trying to increase the signals to row noise ratio by a process called uh, 2D classification. And by having this, your 2D classes or 2D clusters, if you wish, you're able to reconstruct a 3D map, which uh, for instance, for the spike case looks like this. The problem there is that the resolution of your uh, 3D map is uh, sometimes very low. So here, if you see these red regions, uh, you have a C7 angstrom resolution where, where you can't really fit a single structure in these regions. Of the, uh, I mean, despite the, this fact, you can really well build a, uh, a protein structure that best fits your densities into these uh, high resolution regions, like blue and green. But still, we're, I mean, and, and if you really go to the uh, PDB data bank and then you look for, uh, you know, what's going on in these regions of, of my protein, then all of these red parts here actually are not modeled at all. So you are blind as to what your structure is doing in this region. So this is a, a, a real uh, you know, problem. So, and this is a general problem. So people really can't assign a single structure in these lower resolution regions. Why can't they do that? I will explain in a bit. So this is the, the typical electron microscopy data um, we, we have. So these are, these are our, our data. And then uh, coming from uh, the molecular dynamics, or this could be also Monte Carlo, um, you know, configuration generators. Uh, so basically in molecular dynamics here, you have this potential energy surface, as I mentioned earlier, um, you're integrating this, um, the, the, the Newton's equation motions, you're getting the force from the potential and then you're moving on, on your, uh, you're moving into a trajectory, but this uh, trajectory, as I said earlier, also has errors. So this meta-inference or EMI, as we call it, this electron microscopy meta-inference approach is able to get a prior uh, distribution of models. Now, a prior distribution of models, you can consider it as the Boltzmann distribution, for instance, that generates basically, that, that is generated in our case by molecular dynamics, given a prior knowledge, which is the molecular force field. So that's what I stands for now. And then these, uh, so the weights of your prior distribution are on the fly, um, basically adapted so that uh, these, so that they maximally agree with your data. Uh, so this this likelihood function here basically reweights on the fly uh, your uh, molecular, so basically your trajectories so that your uh, models maximally agree with the data. So this is, if you, if you wanna think about it, um, basically you have multiple replicas that are uh, launched uh, in parallel, and then uh, there is an ensemble. So per time step, there is an average over all your replicas. This is the experimental average in our case is an electron microscopy map generated by our configurations. And then this electron microscopy map generated by our configuration also feels, well, uh, a, a potential, um, it's like a harmonic potential. It's a bit more complicated than that, but you can think of it as a, as a harmonic potential um, force so that uh, the ensembled average through your replicas uh, is enveloped and feels forces and, and explores locally, uh, you know, uh, the, the sampling actually, um, so it receives basically an, a very huge force if your average um, configurations are too far from your experimental data. It's a bit more complicated in this. So, so this is how basically we get the probability of models given your data and your force fields. And basically here one can show that this is more like a maximum entropy type of uh, on the fly, um, a, 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 well, constraining or restraining, in fact, approach. And, and in the end, your probability distribution uh, abides to the maximum uh, entropy frame, so, framework. So it gives you the configurations that best fit your data. There is one more thingy here that uh, I, I should have, well, this is partly true. So here we also not only model the models, <laughs> which are our configurational space, but we also model the error in the data. So this is, there should be a comma here, sigma, which is the error in the 
map. So this approach also models the error in the data that we don't know a priori. So that's actually an important point, I think. Right, so, uh, well, it, it's probably a bit more redundant, but here I just wanted to give a, a really a, a throughout of, of how this thing started. So basically I started with Doros uh, in the chemical engineering department uh, where we studied tactic polystyrene. This is a, a, we did a molecular dynamic simulations of, of this very relevant polymer for, for glasses. Um, and uh, yeah, this was the simulation that was in the order of nanoseconds, I, I think. And then we, we calculated the glassy uh, transition. This is this, this type of, um, this as well, identified by the temperature versus the specific volume. And then on these data, we, we perform some um, Markov modeling and uh, we got the eigenvectors of these uh, dynamics. But I mean, I really, this is an introduction. I don't really want to focus on this, but probably it signifies where it all started. Um, right, then I continued with Peter. Peter. Um, so this was more um, on how we can basically use enhanced sampling approaches like path sampling to get the, and this is all without going into the data uh, experimental data incorporation. This was really uh, enhanced sampling based methods to characterize the kinetics of uh, a mechanistic understanding of biomolecules. And this is like, uh, if you consider a nanotube, or, uh, this is, uh, these are just cyclic peptides basically. And, and this is how basically uh, a, a peptide assembles to this nanotube tube. It can do it through various pathways. And there was one pathway where, you know, it firstly docks to the top of the fireball and then uh, and here this is a docking step and then it locks and and then it um, and then it of course you know locks and then if so this is a non-specific binding where it first binds to the side of the tube and then it basically diffuses in, in the 1d space and this is preferred than a 3d diffusion um, and and then it uh, it locks and then it forms and we also did this transition path sampling based approach to characterize this kinetics of, of a dimer binding uh, to the native state. And I, I think these are quite nice methods in the sense that they don't require a react to identify the slow degrees of freedom. And uh, they're actually, in fact, a thousand fold faster um, than brute force MD. Uh, and, and this is nice because we can really sample these problems uh, else would probably, I would probably have to extend my PhD by a few years. Um, of course, then I moved to uh, Michele's uh, group uh, where we, did a, a bit more of an enhanced sampling, uh, molecular dynamics for drug discovery and for conformational transitions. But here the approach is different. So we don't really sample efficiently the configurational space by path-based approach, but we, we basically uh, do so by a reaction coordinate based approach. For instance, here, uh, if, you, if you consider this lysozyme, uh, this is an L99A lysozyme, and you have a conformational transition uh, from the ground state structure that is deposited in the PDB data bank to some type of other state, which is called E, and this was a low populated state, that was also actually reported by an NMR experiment into the data bank. So they did know these two states, the end states, but they actually uh, didn't know what's the mechanism of going from here to here. And actually the, the funny and nice thing was that this lysosome is supposed to bind uh, ligands like benzene, for instance. Uh, but I mean, in none of these uh, high population states, for instance, ground state and this excited state that is also, of course, low populated, but but it's actually, uh, the, the fraction is quite big, you couldn't fit a ligand. So this function actually was, uh, was a bit mysterious. So how can a ligand bind to these two states that can't fit a ligand? So basically by doing this enhanced sampling CV or reaction coordinate based enhanced sampling approach, we, uh, we created a collective variable that is able to sample transitions from the ground state to this lower populated excited state and by doing that, we're able to very efficiently generate configurations of the free energy landscape that crosses uh, this state. And in fact, it turns out that there are two more states on pathway where in fact, in one of these, this is this I-036, you are able actually to feed a ligand. So what I wanna highlight here is that, I mean, dynamics is very important for function. Eh? So we did get the mechan microscopic mechanism, get the populations of the ground and excited state right, 
match the experiments. And this is really the experimental delta G and the predicted delta G. And uh, we also identified some site that was relevant for, uh, for basically you can really, we can really bind a, a benzene here. Right, this was published uh, in, in, uh, in JCTC, and this was all about actually how we're able to optimize collective variables so that you can efficiently sample this transition. And we used a approach called uh, the variational approach to conformational dynamics, but I don't really want to go to the details. Another problem where we implemented this uh, collective variable optimization approach um, to uh, basically study uh, dynamics in the context of drug unbinding was this very study. Here we impose a funnel potential. So this is a restraining potential. Your, your small molecule here is not able to leave uh, the vicinity outside of the funnel. So there is a bit, a bit of, this is in order for you to confine a bit your conformational space. Um, in fact, if you're if you're interested in affinities, then it really matters what is uh, the, the, the relative population of the of the bound state with respect to the unbound. This is a thermodynamic observable. You don't really care what's going on here. So uh, we we launched this uh, optimized collective variable calculations on this problem, uh, and basically we can see reversible transitions from the ligand binding, unbinding, and. And by having these reversible transitions, I have to tell you that this, this, this transition occurs in the millisecond time scale. And we were able to uh, get you know, binding and unbinding transitions of biased dynamics, of course, that are in the order of nanosecond to microseconds. And this was, so this is again, a, 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 an order of, uh, well, three to four orders of magnitude if you consider the reversibility of acceleration. So here we do get the populations of the really the ground state in a sense of the really bound state. And then you have intermediate states, uh, this P and, and B state, uh, and also the unbound state. We compare our affinities. So this is this one to the, the predict, so the predicted to the experimental ones. We see that these more or less fit and, and there's a small error probably because either, I mean, because of the force field or the sampling. I mean, I think we're pretty sure about the sampling here in this case. By the way, it's very interesting that we can also quantify the uh, unbinding rates in a different set of simulations where we don't confine with restricting potential. So by biased simulations, we can unbias our trajectories. And if you want to hear about it, I can let you know. So we can actually, in a, in a, in a you know, uh, we can actually get off rates that are pretty good uh, and we can do so pretty uh, efficiently. And then of course, uh, the, actually a good insight is that, uh, you know, it's been recurring in our, in our studies that, you know, off or on rates actually are much worsely predicted uh, by force fields than the Delta G, so than the thermodynamics. This is also visible here. Look at this difference in the order of magnitude versus the Delta G. So that's probably has to do with the fact that force fields have not optimized by, for kinetics. And I, I, this is a, an active research area I'm uh, working on. Yeah, so this was uh, in this uh, this paper. And uh, yeah, so I mean, this was very nice because with these uh, optimized collective variables, you can have uh, you know, these type of experiments nowadays within a month time, uh, you know. Right, so now I'm jumping into um, this experimental data restraint simulations. Uh, and this is a, a, a case where, again, the protein dynamics is, is quite important if you want to highlight function. So I'm okay. Look, so we, we have to focus here on on the neuron cell, voila, <laughs> and it is so in this area of the of the of the neuron, um, you have a this self-assembled proteins called microtubules. Uh, this was highlighted also in the original uh, video in the in the beginning. This, these are polymers or dimers actually out of uh, alpha and beta tubuling that self-assemble and disassemble. And they are not only important because they allow for uh, you know proteins actually to walk uh, across it and carry cargoes, but it's also important. It's believed to be important for uh, signal, uh, you know, for for catalyzing signal to, uh, through through uh, neuron cells. And what it was. So there's, there's this protein called tau uh, that basically who, whose function is to bind to uh, the, uh, well, two microtubules and stabilize it. So in fact, without this protein tau, microtubules really cannot assemble. 
So without assembly, you get you get uh, cognitive impairment and you you inhibit signal transduction and and basically uh, often in Alzheimer disease patients, uh, you get that you have a change in homeostasis and you have this aberrant phosphorylation of your tau protein. So basically phosphorylation, is, so basically you get, you get a very a false signal, probably kin that you have this overexpression of kinases that they bind to uh, tau on the microtubules. They change serines, for instance, or threonines that are prone to phosphorylate to phosphoserines or phosphoserines and then, or phosphothreonines. And then basically this phosphorylation or hyperphosphorylation causes tau to detach from, from the microtubule. Of course, if, if tau gets detached now from the microtubule, first of all, it self-assembles, and this is the hallmark of Alzheimer's or many tauopathies in fact. And second of all, uh, you, you don't get to have this stabilization of microtubules. Microtubules can no longer form. So you have this dual problem um, due to aberrant phosphorylation. Eh? So what we ask now is, okay, what's really the molecular mechanism um, uh, that basically, that of, of the formation of this complex or what really goes on? So in the past, basically, people uh, had only been able to identify the structure of tau hi highlighted here in red. Oh, is it time or something? So um, well, I'm not sure what's the time. Oh, shit, I'm, I'm fully over. Anyways, so um, yeah. So the point here is that uh, people were able only to identify this red region. What we do with our simulations, we get our, the entire stretch of 200 amino acids. So this is a cryo restraint simulation. Um, and then we're able to quantify the contacts that some residues form with of tau with the microtubules. And then by utilizing this knowledge, uh, we phosphorylate them directly. And then we see that uh, our tool, so our simulations are predictive because if you phosphorylate, you know, previously known amino acids or previously unknown amino acids to regulate the complex like this one, then you, you can really, uh, uh, destabilize the complex. So we're. This is a, basically a reassuring step that we're able to identify sites that are that you know contribute to the stability and that once phosphorylated, they they will probably contribute to destabilization of this uh, complex and and you know having this uh, tangle. So this is one of our replicas, uh, and this is how actually it it moves. So this was all published in ACS Central Science. Now another another showcase is basically this uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike that binds to the ACE2 receptor. So spike uh, fuses into our cells. The first step is recognition to some proteins here. Second step is fusion. We care about this step. So namely, how does spike um, what is the structural ensemble of spike? Spike is surrounded by glycans here in blue. The reason that people can actually resolve a structure for spike is because it's very dynamic. You can see here that the RBD is very dynamic. When we quantify what is the correlation with experiment, we get very good correlation actually with experiment, apart from few sites here. And this probably means that our model, so how we simulate glycans in these positions is, is probably not good. We needed higher order glycans. And then by our by making a free energy surface mechanism of our of, of this opening. So from, I mean, spike undergoes an open to close transition where this is uh, the RBD is facing up towards the RBD is closed. So we're able to quantify the free energy landscape here. And actually we can again find an on pathway intermediate from the open to the closed state where we can actually fit a ligand here. So our idea is now to dock compounds to this place and, and try to jam uh, the dynamics of spike so that it doesn't go from the open to the closed state as, as fast. And therefore we, we let it exposed in some type of semi-open state where neutralizing antibodies can bind to it and, and neutralize it. And this is published um, in ACS Central Science. Last but not least, I, I think I should uh, wrap up, although I actually, I did have some more stuff. So uh, structural ensembles are quite important uh, for uh, basically antibody antigen interactions. So here you have, uh, this is a, a cryo-EM determined spike protein in green. Uh, in red, you have these RBDs, and then in yellow, you have antibodies. They bind to it. And we were able, so we did several simulations of different antibodies bound to spike 
these structures and this cryom data are, are done by James Nisbeth in Oxford. And we quantify the dynamics of each of these, uh, you know, complexes. So the spike part with, with the antibody part. And we did some type of free energy um, estimate or free energy landscape estimate. This is how far you are from the uh, native state. And we find a nice correlation. So the more flexible this complex is, the less uh, you know affine it is, so the higher KD it has. So we find some type of relationship between the dynamics, so the flexibility of this complex and the KD. And these are the different variants. Uh, and by this knowledge, we somehow um, basically we suggested mutations, and then we got some two, some some other uh, complex that also bound with a low uh, affinity. But now, uh, I mean, what we want to do is basically try to rationalize the relationships between structural dynamics um, and and epidemiological or biological biophysical data, like the KDs or like R zeros, and try to encode the relationship between amino acid sequence trained through structural ensembles to well, to predict uh, this type of uh, macroscopic observables uh, coming from, well, KDs or EP, I mean, SPR experiments. Um, and even more, try to fit actually, you know, very macroscopic observables like epidemiological data. So this would be super nice. Anyway, I mean, this is, there is a last part having to do with optimizing force fields to match tar target kinetics of molecular simulations. This is the work that I'm not going to highlight uh, so much here, but basically we're using maximum caliber. Uh, well, here, so I mean, well, this is many equations here, sorry. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, this is, so this is going to be published very soon. So it all has to do basically with how we can reweight path probabilities in order to match kinetic now constraints uh, like rate constants. So we rate pathways instead of reweighting configurations. This is the, in the framework of maximum caliber. So, uh, and, and basically, um, so we reweight trajectories, but another way to reweight trajectories is to change the potential energy function. So we infer the changes in the potential energy function that get you towards a correct rate constant. It can be other type of kinetic uh, observables like, uh, you know, uh, friction, uh, sorry. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you name it, uh, but by, inf by basically inferring the changes in the force field parameters in order for you not going too much from your original force field. So by that, yeah, thanks for your patience and uh, I'm open to any, any questions. Thanks, Fabon. Um, I suppose if people have questions about these slides, um, please feel free to ask. Uh, and we usually just basically people raise their hands and we work through the questions that way. So Anastasia, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Fedon. Nice to meet you again. Hello, Anastasia. Uh, very nice talk and, uh, of course, very interesting works. I'm trying to run after all your projects that you present. So I have a couple of questions. Um, I think I'll remember everything. Uh, in the first part, initially, when you said that uh, good expression model the models, uh, you saw something, um, you saw that uh, you uh, take, uh, let's say, uh, some trajectories coming from different force fields and then, yes, in this part exactly, and then with uh, using this uh, weight, this normalization, which is uh, coming uh, with, uh, through the comparison with experimental data, you evaluate the force fields. Um, uh, give, give me a second. So uh, replace yeah. force fields by replicas. So in fact, we have the same force field, but we have different uh, replicas. So, you know, different, uh, so parallel simulations. And then you make an, at each time step, say that you have 10 parallel simulations. At each time step, you have 10 frames. You make an average over these 10 frames. Uh, okay. Okay. So you make okay. basically an expectation of your observable through these 10 frames, and then you compare this with your 
experimental value. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, I thought you also did it on different force fields, but in any case, uh, the question is about the regions where, as you also said, yeah. uh, the experiment uh, has not accurate data. Let's say these red regions here, mm -hmm. uh, which according to what we know from experiments, um, these regions uh, can be probably very, um, very let's say very fast in their uh, motion and that's why the experiment is not able to detect them so um what happens for that case uh, how do you take this in these regions into account in order to evaluate the force field parameters yeah so i'm uh, typing down an equation that is probably a bit more um uh, well uh, indicative of in fact what goes on uh so like this all right can you see my equation <laughs> so you have the not you have, really really <laughs> not really but oh uh, you have okay. a screen okay uh, uh <laughs> well i mean this is probably here this is, is it visible no this is with this way so you have an energy function that depends on your coordinates and on the error of the experimental data sigma given the data then of course you have the md part that is you know the energy of the md really and then you have a log and then you sum uh, over uh, well your experimental points and your replicas but you see that you don't only f basically the forward model it gets you from x to your data point space but then it's i mean this is like a chi square and then you have to divide with the error on the data point so how okay. do you infer now the error on the data point? Because I mean, you know, these red region points, you don't really have, a, I mean, probably you have a very big error, so you shouldn't trust these points, right? But the okay. thing is that you're also sampling, ooh, sampling, anyway, sampling the error yeah, yeah, I, distribution. I got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is basically how you, you know, you are sure that you are not trusting uh, erroneous data points. So we're really yeah, yeah. sampling this. By Markov chain Monte Carlo, in fact, uh, you assume a prior distribution for your uh, from your error distribution. Like, for instance, we take a Gaussian distribution, but in, but and then uh, we start from a particular uh, sigma value and x value, and then we you know we update x, and then we calculate the the marginal distribution p sigma given x and d, and then uh, we 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 make a new step on the sigma space. And then we update the sigma, sorry, the sigma as well. So first x, then sigma, and then s first x, and then sigma. And that's why I propagate the distribution as well. And yeah, I got, I got it. But in any case, I, I say that um, having this big error, um, you never have um, very accurate data for these regions. So uh, probably you construct a very good model, uh, but you are not sure if um, these regions are well described by uh, by the parameters that you have decided after all this uh, procedure. I think that when you don't have data or when you don't believe in data, our framework basically only believes in the molecular dynamics yeah, yeah. and therefore and therefore there you really are trusting more your molecular dynamics and that's what you get so that's what it is it's it's yeah yeah, yeah. i get i get it okay um, and if I have time for one more, um, in the second part where uh, you discussed about collective variables uh, uh, yeah. for proteins, uh, the method there, um, let's see, yes, somewhere here, um, I'm not sure uh, how we do this. Know how you do this, but um, which is uh, the information that you have from the experimental point of view? You said that you have two states, one, the populated one, let's say the native or uh, how yeah, it's yeah. called, and the other, the last one is the excited, and you search for the intermediate uh, sure. paths. Yeah. Uh, so so the, in order to uh, apply this method, uh, you need to have two states between uh, and you 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 search how to move between them can you do something if you have only one state let's say yeah 
yeah yeah they're very so for instance if you have two states then i mean your life is already easy because you can launch unbiased simulation in each of these states and then you uh, trace some uh, you know descriptors or uh, you know lo cvs and then you optimize the parameterization on the distribute based on the distribution of these cvs in the two these in the, in the two states. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's one way to do it. Another way, if you only have uh, G, uh, for instance, I mean, this was actually the case here in this protein, I mean, um, where basically we, we, have, we only have one structure and this is of the crystal bound uh, structure of the ligand. There basically we do a, an initial simulation where we bias, say the distance. Uh, so this is an agnostic collective variable or a stupid one, which just binds the distance. I mean, your protein, your, your this, this molecule unbinds, so you get some mechanistic understanding. Um, and then uh, basically here we describe to, to, to so you we describe to have you know CVs as function of time that report on agnostic uh, degrees of freedom, like protein uh, ligand contacts, uh, protein water contacts, uh, ligand water contacts. And then we basically check the faith of the generic CVs uh, on your uh, trajectory that is based on just the distance. So you're pulling the thing off. And then by analyzing these data, in fact, uh, we're able to get, um, we, we get some optimized CV. Other ways to, you know, if you only have one state, you can always do, you know, and you don't really know where the thing goes. Here, we did know where, I mean, that this is an unbinding transition. So we knew that the thing needs to go off. But if you didn't, don't really know anything about the mechanism, then I just would uh, take a, a replica exchange molecular dynamics, um, you know, pathway mm -hmm. and then try to identify trajectories and then build on uh, CVs that are based on these trajectories. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm uh, done for now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mingeli, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Fredon. It was very interesting. and. Uh, as Tassi also said, you, you try to describe many different projects. So just a, very, a couple of very basic questions, at least for me to understand. So when you combine data from CryoMM, mm -hmm. CryoM actually, and molecular dynamics, well, but how can we do that exactly? Because CryoM considers different, in principle, at least different uh, scales, right? So what are the data that you combine together? That was not clear to me. Yeah, uh, uh, can, you identify, can you really uh, say what, what do you mean by different scales? No, I'm just wondering from the cryo M, which are the data that you use directly? Yeah, so this is really the EM map data. This is a, vo this is a, a voxel grid. So per grid uh, point, you have some uh, density. And then you, what we do is we take this grid and we convert it uh, to our EM density grid and we convert it to a Gaussian mixture model that uh, best uh, matches your uh, grid. So the, usually the correlations between, and, and, and of course there is an so the system just yeah just to my, so the system is the system the same in both for both cases do you have a single protein let's say I mean uh, yeah so uh, okay it's for instance here and it was grid point how much is its grid point let's say in this cryom analysis is it of the order of uh, a few nanometers or no, but That's what so, so what here, the, no, 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 the grid, the grid point here. So what is in these densities is something in the order of angstrom. Like you, okay. you can really see the resolution here. The resolution so is in angstrom, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, Vangelis, I mean, there is something that is actually uh, plot to what you guys are doing. And this is cryo-electron cryo tomography. There, the, the, the density resolution you can get is, is not in the order of nanometers, or angstrom, but it's more something like in the order of, of tens of nanometers. Uh, so this is, is closer to, uh, you know. I'm just wondering whether you probe, let's say, collective phenomena with the cranium, which is typically more difficult, let's say, to, 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 to probe with the, with the molecular level. But if no, you I... have such a high accuracy, then it's more or less, I mean, you can assume that you have the same, exactly the same, let's say, scales. But yeah, describe uh, the same scales, right? That, that's the, uh, the, apart from the regions where uh, the, I mean, yeah. the, you know you have more, much flexibility and you can't resolve. Um, yeah, so basically, this is and in the end of the day, what the data here are, are, is, a, is a Gaussian mixture model uh, that enters. So this is a voxel map uh, that is converted to a GMM. And do you have very good accuracy, let's say, for the three D for the tomography? I mean, the tomography scenario. So for the three D information from the cryo or not? 
Yeah, so there actually you can't really fit a model, atomistic model at least, uh, in, in EM tomography because the resolution, I mean, is, is, is in the order of tens of uh, even some, yeah, maybe nanometers, I'm not, I think even tens of nanometers. Okay. So these probably report on, uh, yeah, on, on a bigger length scales, in fact, I think. So that, that that's, I think, what tomography can do. Um, for instance, there are people that are using tomography, they're able to characterize the glow, you know, assemblies of, yeah, of yeah. foreigns and membrane proteins like very big. Actually, I have seen exactly, I've seen such pictures. That's why I'm wondering. So for that case, for this scenario, you probably need coarse grain models. Right? Exactly, exactly. I think but they're worked by, by, by Gerhardt. Um, by Gerhard um, on this, uh, from, I mean, Gerhard Humer. So they've been using uh, tomography data uh, together with uh, coarse grained uh, molecular simulations, which might be terrible, of course, but yeah. Okay, and, so, and what's the next step on that now? Is it more on binding let's make mechanisms for drug design? Or yeah, so, so, so this was basically, uh, you know, uh, getting collective variables uh, right in order for you to uh, yeah. study transitions. And I don't really discuss how we devise optimized collective variables, but with mean, the spirit of it, there, there are numerous and now this field is boosting. But uh, the basic idea here is um, that basically we have uh, fluctuations of some degrees of freedom of our system, that some of them are important, some of them are not important. And then you optimize, uh, as you make a, re a, a reduced space 1D, <laughs> Uh, collective variable that best accounts for the slow dynamics. And then if you bias along like an umbrella sampling on a dynamics way approach, you build a bias along these directions, then you get very reversible, uh, you know, transitions, and then you unbias and you, if, and you get the unbiased probability distribution like this one, um, which, but then you do it like a thousand times faster. So uh, there's are, some curiosity here. So did yeah. you compare with metadynamics, let's say, with standard approaches, as you said? Uh, this, is, this is indeed metadynamics. The same, okay. This is indeed metadynamics. And the, the last part was basically how we can, uh, I mean, we can also do, actually, it's interesting point, we can also calculate kinetics now from infrequent metadynamics, which is also quite efficient and fast. But I think this is also a nice point, at least if you talk to experimentalists. So the fact that you can use this cryo-EM restraint methods to... Um, you know, find ensembles of previously undetermined regions. So here, I mean, really appreciate the, the difference of, of uh, you know, so now we have a, a model that maximally ab abides to the data corresponding to a 200 residue sequence as opposed to 60 residue uh, illustrated in red. And then you can get, you know, which residue- So again here, I'm sorry for the interruption, again here, do you have experimental data as well? Exactly, yeah. this is a cryo -EM map. Thanks. This is a cryo EM map enveloping this uh, protein. It's not highlighted okay. here, but this is again cryo EM. Uh, and we get then what interactions are important for the stability of this complex. And then by this is our ensemble, our simulations restrained on cryo EM. And then we ask, okay, what's the fate if you mutate this and you do a directed uh, phosphorylation? If you change the binding, and indeed, yeah, you do change the binding. You mutate so, again, sorry, you mutate what? You mutate, you mutate one. You mutate uh, each one here, two thirty-five or two sixty-two. Okay, and so then you get one side. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then indeed you get that these actually are contributing a lot to the stability of this. So this is quite nice that two different methods actually do uh, uh, agree. And and uh, yeah, this is more like the spike stuff. So this was also the same case. So you have regions that were not resolved because of the dynamics, and we were able to identify these dynamics and then find pathways along a transition where spike is in the open state, meaning that in the state where so when this RBD points up towards the closed state where this RBD, I mean, this is just a protein domain, is down. And then people, ooh, people didn't know how this transition works. And we find that, you know, there are intermediate states where you can probably fit ligands in it and hopefully be able to jam this uh, dynamics in order for you to inhibit this transition. Because yeah, you would like to stabilize this in one state and then uh, leave the possibility for uh, antibodies to attack uh, spike. And this was the last part about, I mean, yeah, how yeah. you can use different simulations in order to probably introduce mutations. And we find that, you know, I mean, this is something to be probably expected, eh? that more a dynamic complex it is, 
um, yeah, the more uh, so the less well it binds. Uh, but I mean, this was not. Uh, on the other hand, you can argue against this. Uh, but I mean, this is what we find here, and with these mutations based on on this knowledge. This is very interesting. If if it's possible to control these mutations, this and. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's what we want to do by using this uh, alpha fold type of uh, framework. Okay. So, so basically, we, we want to uh, give sequence of, of this complex and then feed it in a neural network that is trained now, not only on single structures, but on dynamic structures. And by this, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, use some type of uh, encoding uh, or, or feature space uh, that best takes, you know, that, that encodes well the structure, but also encodes well the dynamics, and then be able to predict, you know, to, to predict some type of uh, ensemble, and then reiterate once, once your algorithm is converged. And then, of course, uh, so in the end, and, and, and of course, you cannot train not only on, uh, on dynamics, but you can train on dynamics plus you know, other type of macroscopic data like R zeros and KDs and stuff like that. So you can reiterate in order to optimize the relationship between sequence and structure ensembles, comma, KDs, R zeros. And actually this has already begun uh, in Barcelona with uh, Modesco, Modesco Rothko. So we're now simulating, the goal is to simulate 500 complexes where we're already, you know, we, we have a hundred, but uh, mm -hmm. I think this is uh, quite nice. I hope at least it's really painful. <laughs> yeah, well, this is very demanding and the long simulation. Okay, thanks. Good, for the, the, the good about it, Vangelis, is that we are actually doing uh, enhanced sampling. So this is point A, point B is that we're doing restraint simulations, and this sufficiently mm -hmm. narrows down the confirmation on space search into the relevant part, best abides to the map. So we're never going to see something that unfolds here. Okay, we can extend the discussion later for that. Thanks. Ioannis, uh, for... please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Fabiana, for the very insightful and rich uh, presentation. I also have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, firstly, about the, the development of uh, uh, your uh, potential using the CRIOM data and the molecular dynamics uh, simulations. Uh, do you have a criterion, uh, I suppose, uh, you have a criterion according to which uh, you select uh, or not uh, uh, molecular dynamics predi uh, prediction with respect to experimental data when so, carrying out your, your, the simulations of your replicas? Yeah, so basically you are now, so, so, so the, the data basically, as I said, is an EM map uh, that of course corresponds to all degrees of freedom of your protein. And then if we, if we have to be fair and, and compare with uh, basically EM maps that are generated by considering all the degrees of freedom of your molecular dynamics protein model. So then the, 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 we're, we're taking account the entire uh, protein degrees of freedom to build an EM map generating. So to build an EM map and then compare to the experimental data map. I think that it would be nice if you if you have a look on either this paper or, or this paper where, where it absolutely uh, narrows this down to the exact equations, but we are comparing apples with apples. Eh? So this is really all degrees of freedom of protein with, with the experimental map. Okay. And uh, with respect to your enhanced sampling uh, simulations, yeah. um, uh, do you, uh, I suppose, as you said, it's, uh, it's a kind of meta dynamics. I'm, I'm not yeah, exactly. on that, but do you, uh, but I suppose it resembles your method with uh, event driven simulation with, or with uh, rare events. So is it, uh, do you construct a sort of a transition path between the two states? That you want to to simulate that yeah you want to move from uh, yeah from your initial uh, state to the to, to the unbinding say by the way in here are you talking about now cryo em data uh, about this stuff or are you talking about this other stuff here no no i'm talking about uh, yes this one yeah okay so 
and if I understand correctly, I mean, this is truly obtained by uh, metadynamics. And then uh, there, there are various approaches. Eh? There are approaches where you know many states and then you can build a collective variable. So you know the two states, but you don't know what's going on in the middle. So you can find a, I mean, you can, you can find a, uh, you can, f you know, devise a CV based on the sole knowledge of the two states. There are also, so this is, for instance, the HLDA work we did uh, does exactly that. So this is a linear discriminant analysis that classifies. So basically it devises a CV so that uh, the fluctuations in the basins are best separated. So it defines a separatrix in the, in the CV space that, that best separates the two the fluctuations in the states. But the, the algorithm here knows nothing about intermediates, not, knows nothing about pathways. There is another approach, which is called the VAC method, variational approach, confirmation of dynamics, where basically you need a trajectory that is not perfect. And this was uh, also, you know, and this was done also, you know, here, here we had a single state, we launched a few trajectories, and then we found a collective variable that best parameterizes the slow collective variable, or if you wish, the eigenvector that has an associated negative value that decays slowly on the space of uh, that spans the collective variables n. Uh, so this is another way to, to devise a, a collective variable. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's more than one. Eh? So you, depending on the problem, of course. So you, yeah, you can also, you know, you can devise CVs based on trajectory data, based on only stable state data, or uh, if you don't know anything, you just, uh, you know, do take the uh, collective variables that probably report to strong interactions in the state, and then uh, you launch some simulation that also has uh, temperature involved. For instance, one of them might be the parallel bias uh, metadynamics with parallel tempering, for instance. And uh, with respect to your results, your uh, uh, your binding free energy, uh, have you compared your results with experimental data? Yeah, I mean, this is what uh, is probably shown here. Eh? So this is the delta G experimental and the delta okay. G predicted for this and for that um, experiment. So yeah, that's, I think they're yeah, quite yeah. okay. They're, yeah, they seem really nice. And that one thing you should probably note is that you can nowadays get K offs. Right? So that's quite important. Uh, from uh, that's probably counterintuitive, but you can you can do some smart tricks in order for you to unbias bias trajectories. So this really this approach is called infrequent metadynamics, and you uh, you know you start with the simulation, but you deposit hills infrequently. So by doing such such um, you you basically jump from one state to the other without touching the transition state, and then you are able to check if this criterion is met uh, by uh, a Kolmogorov test, assessing if your jump times follow a Poisson distribution. So this is a quite nice, quite nice way to calculate rates if you have a good collective variable. So the worse the collective variable, the more unlikely it is that your kinetics will be drawn or your binding jump times or escape times will be drawn from a Poisson distribution. So it really has to do also with the CV optimization. But I mean, there are lots of uh, CV optimization uh, methods nowadays. I suppose there must be uh, many methods in order to examine possible uh, coupling between collective variables that changes and it's coupling to other variables uh, whether that is uh, that leads to physical uh, uh, that to distributions that have a physical meaning or not that's actually a very good point huh? so uh, okay for instance if you if you um, if you do this uh, variational approach conformational dynamics what you're doing is you're you're finding so basically you're parameterizing your eigen basically your it's, it's like something parameterizing your propagator so the px is a propagator function uh, some some function that takes your initial configuration and drives it to the next step uh, okay so Right, so this is this is that, but the, so we are in this variational approach conformation language. You approximate this by some correlation function, and this correlation function uh, is, is is lives in the state of CVs, and then you're asking, okay, what is my vector on the direction that sort of separates my time scales, and and there uh, your uh, descriptors 
so the descriptors that move slow pick up high weights, but it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it doesn't really tell you who drives whom. So uh, is it a driven process or is it truly an uh, uncoupled process? Uh, I th in the context of, of I mean, at least in the problems I've faced, this was not a problem because in the end of the day, you need um, you need basically just uh, crossings and to converge free energies, free energies. However, I mean, there are other approaches like, uh, for instance, that are that basically also have an extra criteria and they ask what is the minimal model that best parameterizes my kinetics um, so there basically you you uh, exclude at least if you I mean, you, you exclude driven uh, or at least parameters that don't add more information uh, in your uh, in your model and i can i can point probably to the work by baron peters and, and, and Peters and Trout, uh, this is in 2000, I think six, where they parameterize a commuter function by asking what is the, the lower, so the, the, the lowest, com, so the lowest, well, the smallest, in fact, model that best parameterizes my function. And they have this Bayesian inference criterion on what's the, you know, extra gain information if you add a, an extra parameter. So, I think this is a nice direction. There is also a work, but you know, that requires minimal models, and these minimal models actually are also cool if you're working with neural networks and try to parameterize, uh, you know, atomistic potentials based on QM calculations. You really don't want to overfit, do you? So uh, you need some type of criterion uh, to, to, yeah. So I mean, there is work uh, by by also Bernd uh, Ensing uh, on, on this direction that try to ask, and and the work is called. I think Discova, it's just a pretty name, uh, that, that aim on the minimal model. Yeah, I'm sure it's a very, very rich field, a very, very long discussion. But uh, thanks very much. Um, there's a question by Panayota, and then I think afterwards people can just uh, unmute their microphones and go ahead and ask. Panayota, please. Hi, Fedon. Uh, thank you. This was a, a lovely talk. Uh, I was actually, uh, I, I wanted to see the last part actually with a, with a little bit of maths. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, give this us one? a quick overview. Uh, the last part that you couldn't cover. Oh, you mean the rate constants? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be. Uh... Okay, so what would you like to know about it? Uh, I mean, for first of all, uh, this is a max and okay. So, okay, I think it's very similar to uh, re, um, what people do in um, how IBI, right? It ever uh, so it is very close to that. So the or or maximum, yeah, I think it's is it IBI? Probably you're more expert than me on that. But the in any case, entropy, yeah. sorry oh, for the interruption. Oh. Relative entropy. Okay, so this, this is, is very similar entropy. to relative entropy. So it's an okay. optimization for maximization of uh, the maximum entropy principle. Yeah. So here, instead of looking, uh, basically, okay. So you, so in the core, I mean, I'm not sure your background, but if you have a coarse grained model, for instance, P X, but you don't know that depends on the alpha parameters of your coarse grained model, and then you have an original distribution uh, that is the unbiased distribution, and then you can always uh, try to. Uh, find the probability distribution of the probability distribution of your cross grain model um, that is as close as possible to the atomistic uh, distribution and then this is probably how you get your alpha parameters but now we're at least in this example and this was uh, in fact published in our yeah you should probably look up in the PNAS uh, 2021 we have a publication about it on how we can uh, use the maximum caliber entropy so this is now forget about the configurations, just replace it with, uh, with trajectories. And now uh, we, instead of uh, asking for, uh, for, for, for a observable that is on, on the configurations, then we have an observable that basically depends on pathways. Rate constant is such an observable because a rate constant is nothing but, you know, if you have an MD and you have many pathways and then you just are in state A and then you have many pathways that start in state A, but then they go, but then they go back. So you count this is one pathway, second pathway that goes, starts in A, ends in A. So you have many pathways that start in A and in A, but you have say one that just made it. So if you count now the fraction of times that you had the jump versus the fraction of times that you, you had this recrossing type of uh, trajectory, 
then uh, you have an estimate of this uh, well rate, and of course you 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 do it for all trajectories, and this is now your exp your rate constant times a flux fact flux factor. Forget about it at the moment. Uh, so this is now your experimental rate. But the question is how uh, how can we yeah, this is your constraint, fine. But the, the, the point is that, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, what you want to do is, to, yeah, here we go. So you want to, again, this is on configurations, but uh, let's start with configurations and move to pathways. So suppose now you have, you have your prior distribution, just an MD, and then you want to reach some posterior distribution that meets your experimental constraint. For instance, this could be a radius of gyration, for instance. Uh, fine. Now the, uh, we we make a Lagrange function uh, and we solve it in the, by, by using the Lagrange multipliers uh, menu. So you basically have your your observable in your MD. So each for each time step you have your uh, RG, and then of course you make an ensemble average um, of your RG, and this is now your um, your MD based ensemble average. Of course there is a difference with the experiment. Uh, and 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 this isn't just a number. Uh, so now the question is, okay, how can I change my p of x so that this difference is minimized? If you if you solve this uh, derivative of l with respect to p, you are left with this maximum entropy solution. So in the end of the day, when once this, and it's all about what are my menus. So these are the multipliers. Um, that act on your CV, uh, at the end of the day, if you have a menu, and of course you have your S of X, this is your trajectory, then you are reweighting your each X coordinate by this exp exponential function. So this exponential of a constant, M here goes from one to M, M, M big M is basically the, ensemble, so the, the experiments, forget about the sum, if you only have one, you have just a one here. So basically, you're weighting each configuration with this exponential function that is mu to the x. So it's like basically each of your, so consider this. So you have your original potential, basically free energy as a function of s. So this is your free energy minus log p. And then your, uh, your uh, MD average or coarse grained average is here. But basically, your experimental average is here. So you want, you are, uh, by, by solving, by, by the, so the, if you solve this uh, problem, your menu is nothing but a coefficient. So basically it's a, it's a potential, a linear potential along, along your S observable that tilts your, uh, tilts your free energy. So basically we're starting from a, from a free energy like this. You're applying this tilting potential and then you're getting to a posterior free energy that looks like this. This is a tilted free energy whose ensemble average property is basically matches the experiment. And now in our approach, basically we have really uh, taken this framework replaced with pathways. This gets you automatically to the maximum caliber. And instead of having S here being something that depends on the configuration, we make some uh, function that uh, that recruits, so by uh, uh, reweight trajectories and reports now not on a radius of gyration but something that has to do with the rate. So that's uh, really something that is summarized and it's very complicated here, but it's definitely, uh, yeah. So it's definitely in the PNAS paper 2021, and also we are actually publishing a paper now, uh, submitting a paper that reweights your potential energies. So it re so changes your potential energy in order for you to match a rate. That's actually very important. So we don't reweight trajectories a posteriori, but we reweight really uh, the potential. And we're able to find which parameters of your potential change least, uh, I mean, get you the least far away from your prior distribution. And uh, I think it's pretty nice if you're dealing with, uh, yeah, lots of terms. Okay, thanks a lot. Silence. Since we are in this slide, may I ask something more? For now, of course, you know, this it's the dating to ask even more. Uh, so, uh, we, what is exactly the S that you use here? What's the collective variable? Uh, for what? For the rate or for this one? For this, for this one. So, do you. No, no, no. Yeah, it's... For for this very problem, which is not the rate problem, and it's uh, it's it's an old work uh, already from other people, uh, they, for instance, uh, for in yeah, I'm not. I mean, this is a general S, but for instance, 
this could be, I don't know, if you are talking about, um, I, I think no, people- For your are, problem. You know, a, a, main, say, a main question in all these methods, because as you say, oh. here you are trying to, to, to parameterize the probability distribution function between two different probability measures, more or less, that's the relative entropy. I'm yeah. just wondering, so if you do that based on a specific collective variable, no, oh, but but, but look, look, that the thing is that this one is no, this is the look uh, in this framework. I, I should, anyway, but in this framework, S is your experimental S. So, whatever your experimental data yeah, yeah, is. What, what's the experimental data? That's oh, it could be, for instance, uh, radius of gyration. It could be. Yeah, if you do it, let's say, in the radius of gyration, as you say, then the question is whether the resulting the output that you get, whether it's transferable to a different kind of structural measures. This is my point. So, the question yeah, I see is. The point. No, uh, you what, might be able sure. to opi or when you optimize it based on a single, yeah, yeah. let's say, observable. No, you should. This is always a question. This is always no, a question. That, that's understandable. So, eh? There is not yeah. a perfect method. I'm just trying to understand how this applies to your, yeah. your method. Uh, so, so it, it really depends on the nature of your constraints. For instance, if you have NMR data that they are constraining on chemical shifts, where the chemical shifts are reporting on. Um, you know, reorientation of dipoles that have to do with the relaxation times of hydrogen bonds and beta sheet formation there. It's very good to capture, of course, beta sheets and, and hydrogen bonds. Uh, so, and then of course you get stuff that are automatically related to these. Uh, but for instance, Delta G is more of a, of a, of a sorry, RG, Radius gyration is then uh, reporting only on the global fold, so uh, it doesn't really do well in the. So in your problem, the, the particulars. In your problem, which data do you use exactly? No, but I mean this is really not my problem. So uh, sorry problem. about this. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I probably should uh, really go here and. Uh, no, it's okay. So my, my so, in my, so in my problem, this was the rate constant. The rate constant of what? Which process? Of folding. Uh, so and the idea is to, to parameterize, to reparameterize the model in order to reproduce the probability distribution function of specific rate constants. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so of just... particular of a particular, so I will show you here. I think this is very illustrative. So here you have uh, let's go to the protein. Uh, we go. There we go. Okay, so here we have uh, Q. So this is a protein, like a, a small protein. This is the state A is the folded state. State B is the unfolded state. Uh, a focus on, on panel A. Uh, and what we have in panel A basically is x-axis is the measure of foldedness. So if you're on the left, then you have small fraction of native contacts, meaning that you're unfolded. If you're on the right, you, fall, you have large number of rate of native contacts. So you're folded. So if you plot, uh, you do an MD simulation, and this was an unbiased trajectory from D-Show, and you quantify the fringing landscape along this uh, folding uh, Q parameter, fraction of native contacts with respect to solvent accessible surface. Um, and then you get, of course, something where the barrier, the free energy barrier is, is, is about here. Eh? Um, however, if you now uh, target, so then we know that you know the folding rate from the experiment for this protein was in fact, uh, some, uh, I'm not sure how much, but it was, uh, well, slower. Eh? So the experimental rate was slower. So this is the time scale for the experimental rate. And, and this is the time scale for the, uh, for the atomistic uh, rate. So actually it was, uh, yeah, well, uh, probably uh, three times or so, uh, or four times slower. So the true rate was folding rate was slower than the MD rate by a factor of three or four. So we impose this constraint, we reweight our trajectories and we get a new free energy landscape like here. So the new free energy landscape has a tilted barrier top more to the fold, more, more to the right. And if, so this is more, this means that our sort of our original TS looked like this transition state, but our posterior transition state forms more bonds. And actually we have no information about bonds whatsoever in our forward model here. We really constrained on rates, but we see that uh, the, uh, had, of course, other observables are affected. Of course, we are waiting pathways. Your other observables are shifted into their distributions. And we find that this TS prime is more uh, native-like, in fact, because your, your, your free energy surface shifts to the right. Nice that you can also uh, have commuter 
projections. Eh? So this is more the probability to be in B given that you were in A and it goes from zero to one. So that's, I think, a, a case where you see that, yeah, of course, other ensemble observables are affected. Can, can you, just as a follow-up, can you use multiple observables in this formulation? I mean, you can in principle, but uh, from the yeah. point from the... So, uh, yeah, so the, uh, look, so in this type of problem, we haven't implemented, uh, we haven't implemented more observables. What we, what, we, what, what we impose here are rate constants and equilibrium sorry, rate coefficients and equilibrium constant. The, the framework here will allow that, but actually we have decided to uh, basically jump to uh, another framework. Uh, basically, it's not an, it's, it's the same framework, but it, it, it changes the potential energy function. Uh, and in, in that framework, we can impose constraint not only on the kinetics, but also on the thermodynamics. So this is, so we are shifting towards the weighting of trajectories towards uh, the, basically basically changing the potential energy function in order to reweight trajectories here we're waiting based on the collective variable that reports on the rate mm -hmm. so in that in that other framework and then probably i should open another uh, another file there yes there we can do uh, also uh, thermodynamics thanks Tim. and this will be up uh, probably we will be very interested because we're using uh, yeah so then, have you find that um, alpha fold that you mentioned uh, is effective in this kind of proteins, which are uh, quite uh, long, as I show? No, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is this is really the problem. Eh? So if you if you go, for instance, and try to add uh, oh, input an IDP into alpha fold, an IDP, an intrinsically disordered protein region. Uh, there you find that uh, I mean you get you get wrong stuff, very wrong stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, and this is quantified by a matrix metric mm -hmm. um, that tells you about the trustworthiness of the model. So in these regions where you have lots of flexibility and lots of dynamics, alpha fold is like terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. The same. That's why I asked. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, but it's not strange. This is just again because this part is very flexible. So this is not within the data set that the alpha flow fold. But independent uh, of this, it's not within the training data set. Yeah, yeah but independent of the flexible part, let's say for the rest part, uh, which is uh, a quite long protein, uh, do you take uh, let's say good results uh, through alpha fold? Yeah, in fact, in alpha fold and Rosetta fold, you can also have a template. So uh, for the region, yeah. So the, the the short answer is yes. Okay, okay. And uh, from curiosity, uh, how long is this uh, kind of molecule? How many residues do you have? So this is a, yeah, yeah. This is a, no, it's it's really a three thousand five hundred residues. Ah, okay. It's it's a big one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So we're talking about typical simulations of, uh, of, of you know, 600,000 atoms here, all atoms. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, and uh, in fact, I will, I will probably um, inject one more thing because I'm uh, definitely sure that, uh, uh, I mean, it definitely interests uh, this group. Um, so it really has to do with, uh, I mean, it can, can I do that? Uh, or yeah, is it this one? No, it's not. Anyway, so there is a point about, um, yeah, I mean, if I don't find it, actually, I don't find it. But I know that you've been working on the trying to use maximum caliber or, or stuff that report on how do we fix force fields for kinetics. So that's actually a challenging problem. I don't know your, your, your views about this, uh, but um, yeah, we are, we are also uh, trying trying to do this, and maybe I, I was trying actually to pull something that um, that that points in this direction. But maybe we have to wait until until like because I can't find it. So that's uh, blimey. Anyway, we can have a separate talk. I talk, I suppose. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. No worries for this. Well. We can have. Uh, I mean, we can have an extra seminar next time, or we can have you here with physical presence if you would like. So. Sometime, yeah. See. If you would like to visit us, yeah, let's see. Yeah, that, that would be nice. I suppose yeah. it will be autumn, autumn or so. It's, it's much better. I mean, uh... yeah, yeah.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.